Hey, hockey fans, welcome to the 7-Eleven Overtime Podcast. I'm your host, Gino Retta. You know, I've spent more than four decades working in the game, fortunate enough to meet some of the legends of the game. Saw them come into the league, watched them shine in the game, and now they've moved on to life after hockey. The 7-Eleven Podcast gives us a chance to catch up, tell some great stories, relive some great memories, and hear what they're up to today. Today's NHL legend, 41st in the NHL all-time goal scoring list, 45th in the NHL's all-time point scoring list, a USA Hockey Hall of Famer, third on the all-time goals list amongst U.S.-born players, one of only four U.S.-born players to score 500 in NHL history, Jeremy Roenick, better known as JR. How are you, my friend? Good to catch up with you. Uh, Gino, it's so good to see you. It's been a long time. Uh, you you call, call me a legend. I think we can call you a legend just as easy. So I appreciate the intro, but even better being with you, man. It's really a pleasure, really. Thanks for having me. It's really good. And for those who are watching on the on the actual podcast of, when you're in the video of it, I got to ask you, JR, you've got this, this beautiful, is it a sketch? Is it a print? Is it of horses yeah, behind print. you? Yeah, like, are you into horses now? What is this all about? Well, unfortunately, yes, because of my wife and my daughter. And um, unfortunately, because you know, of the expense. I, yeah, I always say, you know, they they eat hundreds and poop pennies. You know, it's oh, just beautiful. That, that that's kind of what what um, what my my involvement is. I pay for them, but it gives my wife and my daughter so much pleasure and happiness in what they're doing. And my wife is actually a trainer in dressage that's the discipline of, yeah. of horses that she has so she has a, a big business here in san diego where she trains and will at times compete but it's my daughter really who's the true uh, champion of of the sport uh she was the number one rider in north america uh at 18 years old and unfortunately went through wow. a um yeah she was like number one she was on her way to be an olympian and then life got in the way, Gene. You know, and you know how you know mental illness uh, happens. Yeah. And my daughter yeah. struggled with a lot of um, uh, a lot of mental problems in terms of um, uh, depression and suicidal tendencies and stuff that wow. happens with kids. And you know they get caught. And she was strong enough to uh, to you know to go to places that help her, go to people that helped her. And she came out at 21 years old and decided that she was going to take over the horse world again. And she moved to Germany. Wow. And, and started working for the largest breeding farm in the world, a company called Schakamola, uh, out in northern Germany. And now she, uh, now she, um, she breaks and trains stallions uh, in Germany, and it's probably she's probably responsible for about fifteen million euros in horses every single wow. day. Yeah. So, and she just loves it. She's happier than she's ever been. So, you know, the horses are very important in our life for a lot of reasons. They are uh, not only bring happiness, but they also they also help the mind, and it's um, it's just an amazing thing. I had no idea, Jr., that you were going through this, my friend. How are you guys doing? Yeah. How how's she doing now? How are you guys doing as a family? Because I imagine great that yeah. must have been just really really difficult for you guys that whole process. Yes, yeah, it, it is, and you know it, it's it's not easy sometimes growing up in a professional household. Whether you're the the professional like me, you know, I went through my problems. Uh, 2006 to 2007, 2005 to 2007 that we can, we can chat about also. But, um, you know, my daughter just had that, she, she just didn't seem to fit in a lot of situations. And, um, you know, we, we're a strong family. My wife is an extremely strong woman. Um, she is, uh, she's very passionate and, you know, between, you know, the love of, uh, of the family and the commitment to, you know, to not let her go down hill and for her to find, to really, realize that she had a problem, you know, which is obviously the first step. Um, you know, we're very, very close family. You know, my daughter's happy. My son is living in San Diego. He's got a great job. And, you know, we just, um, we're just enjoying this time of our lives to tell you the truth. Wow. JR, I, I got to tell you, this is not the direction I thought we were heading at all. And I will only go. As, oh, you as, can go wherever you want. You can go wherever you want. It's all good. Okay. Seriously. Uh, my life's an open book. Okay. Well, let me, let me share something with you just, um, three days ago. Oh crap. I was not expecting this to happen then. Mm. Three days ago I shared a video of my own personal journey uh with mental health struggles mm. that's just occurred over the last year. And it was a really, really difficult thing for me to kind of mm. put out there. I, I felt like putting out there was like, okay, look, this could happen. Uh there's battles going on that maybe we don't visualize. And mm. and clearly there was a battle going on with you that that we didn't know about and your daughter and, and good. I mean, the first comment I have to you is good on you and your wife 
and your family for not ignoring and yeah mm -hmm. and giving your daughter the opportunity and all the support that she needed and it's great to hear that she's doing so well so this is very very a hot button topic to me right now talk to us about what you went through in 06 and 07 to to the extent that you'd like yeah. to share about it yeah no i i i, I sure will well i i wanted to um I wanted to tell this story kind of in um, maybe a Hall of Fame situation, but you know I don't think that's going to come. So it's not over yet, mind. Jr. That's not over yet, and we'll discuss that. And, we'll talk uh, about that. I, I'm not I'm not going to hold my breath, but we can talk yeah. about that. However, you know, and by the way, good for you because I, I think you don't have to be embarrassed about having um, mental issues, struggling with um, with your confidence, struggling with personal issues. You can't be embarrassed about that. You, you have to lean on your friends and lean on, on the fact that there are better things ahead. And if you don't take yeah. care of them, if you just let them fluster and linger, then they're going to get worse. And um, so it, it's not an embarrassing thing. It's almost, it's a, it's a, it's a pride thing and a, and a brave thing to come out and say, Hey, listen, I got to get help. So good for you. And good for my daughter for realizing that and battling through it for me. I had somebody literally save my life and not as in the, the literal sense where I was drowning or dying. But uh, after the 2005 season in LA and Sam and Phoenix, uh, I had a terrible year in LA at coming out of the lockout. Cause I really was, I really was mad. I was mad at the league for shutting us down. Uh, I was mad uh, that I just came off of a really brutal injury with a broken jaw and another concussion during the playoffs. Um, and my head was kind of all over the place. And I had a really bad year in LA uh, on the ice, off the ice. I did everything I could for the community, but on the ice, I did not have a good year and it kind of hurt my reputation and, you know, my stock. Uh, Gretz called me and brought me to Phoenix, yeah. but I, th I think, I think they brought me to Phoenix, Gino, really to sell tickets, not really to be an influence on the ice. And I worked my ass off that summer. I was probably in the best yeah. shape going, going into that 2006, 2007 season with Phoenix ready to play and i didn't think i got a fair shake there i didn't play much i was on the outskirts gretz and i had a had a lot of um a, a lot of uh, i think inner inner turmoil as much as i love gretz he's he's one of my good friends i love him to death but we just didn't see eye to eye as a player mm -hmm. and a coach yeah after after that season i was four goals shy of 500 mm -hmm. and um come Ju july 1st the free agent my phone was not ringing there was not one person calling I wasn't getting any offers and it can, and it lingered the July passed still nothing going into August. Um, I kind of had this, this, um, this feeling that this, that my, my career was going to end this way Four goal shy of 500 yeah. had a store storied career. Obviously, Which was an incredible most, milestone, man. 500 yeah, it was an it, incredible it milestone. Yeah. I, I, I wanted it bad for, for myself and for my family and, and, you know, for, for my mom and dad too. Um, so, you know, I started really going heavy, heavy in the booze. And I really started, I was really in depression. I, and I remember I was up in Sun Valley, Idaho. And my wife was really, really concerned about me because I disappeared for a day or two. And I was really, you know, I was really, really depressed. And, you know, it, you could feel myself going in this, this direction. And I knew that, that this is not, it was probably, if I didn't get a job, it wasn't going to end well for me because, I'm such a competitive and passionate person. I don't know whether, whether I would have been able to uh, to move on to the next level. And I could be wrong, but at the time I didn't, I, you know, just heavy, heavy. It's almost like the leaving Las Vegas, you know, the movie leaving yeah. Las Vegas, Nicolas yeah. Cage. It was kind of almost to that situation. And um, I got a miraculous phone call from uh, Doug Wilson. And by the way, this is the first time I've ever told this story. So um, the tell it shows you how I feel about you and, 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 and your audience. So it's really important. Um, got a call from Doug Wilson and he asked me to fly to San Jose. So I flew to San Jose. This is late August. And um, I, he said, uh, he picked me up at the airport. We went to the golf course. We got in a golf cart. He ordered a uh, six, you know, six pack of, uh, of Bud Lights and uh, we got in the cart and we just started driving and he said, JR, he says, what's, what's, what's up? You know, he's because he, Doug Wilson's a, is, he's is a, a very, 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 he is one of the classiest men that we've ever had ever. as a player ever. in management in the NHL. No question. He was my first roommate too in Chicago when I came up at 18. So he really, he, he brought me into the league and he took me out of the league. Uh -huh. And it was, 
So we're on the golf cart and we're on the third hole and as I, we're just talking and we're just kind of going over my career and what happened the last couple of years. And um, we're drinking, shooting, playing. And um, he finally looked at me and said, how would you like to come play for the Sharks this year? And I looked at him and almost got a little emotional. And uh, he says, uh, I said, absolutely. I would love to come play. I, you know, I, I need this. And he's like, like, okay. He goes, I'll let you come play for us. And he says, but I have three stipulations. Three. He says, number one, no media. You can't, you can't do media yeah. unless we, unless our guys come and say, JR, yeah. can you go talk to the media? No, no media, no nothing. You're just going to be a, a good soldier. You're going to be a leader. You're going to be one of the KG veterans. You're going to help the young guys, but no media. You're just going to come play be the, be the person that you are, the player that you are. I said, that's fine. That's great. He said, number two, you got to play at the minimum. I got to pay you the minimum. 500,000 was, was the minimum at the time. I yeah. said, Doug, this is not about, this is not about money. Yeah. And the third thing he says is he said, no booze, no alcohol. You cannot wow. drink. You cannot drink the whole year. If you, if I find out that you were drinking, uh, I'm going to have to release you and let you go. I had a beer in my hand. And looking right at him and literally never took my eyes off him. And I dumped the beer oh, out, man. out on the golf course. And I dropped the can and I reached out, shook his hand. And I said, deal. And, um, you know, I scored my, I went home, worked my ass off, got into shape. I ended up scoring my 500th goal in early November against yeah. Arizona, you know, mm -hmm. against Gretz, against I Arizona. That very well. Yeah. Uh, I scored, I think I scored 15 goals that year, 16 goals, had 40 something points as a fourth liner um, and had a great, great year and kind of brought myself back to where, you know, I, I, I was a mentor for some of the young kids. Um, Doug signed me for another year uh, for 1.1 million um, yeah. after that. And um, he literally saved my life, Gino. There's no question about it. And he was the he was the person at the end when I wanted to play one more year. Um, sitting across the desk from him, he looked at me and says, "You know what, Jr. You've had your you've had a career. You've come back. Yeah. You've showed people who you are. You've had two great seasons for us that we thank you for. You've had so many injuries, so many concussions. You never know when that next one could be the most damaging one." He goes, "With the exception of the Stanley Cup, I think you've done all that you can do." And I remember, and I needed somebody like that to tell me that it was over. And I remember when he said that to me, Gino, it's like the, the weight of the entire world lifted off my shoulders. And I took the biggest breath of fresh air that I've ever taken in my life. And I have not missed skating one second since he said that. Uh, don't miss playing the game. I love the game passionately. I love watching the game. But... I do not want to play the game again. And I have no desire because I knew it was the right time, but I needed somebody that I trusted and respected to tell me. And that Doug Wilson was that guy. That's amazing. And you were able to accomplish what you, what you needed to do to get number 500 there. You became one of only four guys in NHL history, U S born players to accomplish that feat. So it's, it's a remarkable feat. So how are you? How are you now? Now we're, you know, that was Oh six. We're like, 14 years later, how are you doing? How are you doing? I'm right great. Now? I'm, I'm great. I, I never thought that I would be as happy as I am right now. Um, I, uh, I live in San Diego. I'm kind of away from all the hoopla. Um, yeah. I, I, you know, I play a lot of golf. I actually have a real job. I work for a construction company where I'm a salesperson and as being a salesperson, you know what I do, Gina, I go out and I entertain people. I have, I take people golfing. I take them, uh, I take them to sporting events and I, you know, I, I, I have a great time with people, which is one of my favorite things to do. And, and I helped this company become one of the largest GC companies in, in, in California. And, you know, I just started this little, this little baby, you know, which we can talk about my, my whiskey. I have a chocolate oh, whiskey that I've started. A chocolate oh. whiskey. Is that what you said? Yeah. Yeah. A chocolate whiskey. And this bottle that you see, we put a flash. Just check, let me it. just check my front yeah. door. I didn't, yeah. I didn't get a delivery. Jim. Yeah. Just... <laughs> Don't worry. You'll get one. Uh, but this, this, this bottle just won its second award. We've only been open for six months, but this, this bottle won its second award already. Nice. And you know, you know I, I'm, I'm happy. I, I, you know, I really, I'm doing a lot of events. I'm doing a lot of golf tournaments. I'm speaking. I'm doing 
I'm actually going to do, you know, these hockey events for the NHL alumni and helping to raise, raise money for charities. And, um, yeah, I'm in a good place. I, I really am. That's you know, awesome. it's, it's a lot of fun. Yeah, it's really good. Okay. You and I are buddies. So I'm going to ask you a tough question now. And I've been humming and hawing about this for a couple of minutes in my head. Do I ask yep. this to JR? And I think I know you well enough and, and you don't have to answer if you don't want to. Uh, you, you mentioned dumping that beer when, mm -hmm. when Dougie said to you, you can't drink at that point, where are you now? Are you comfortable with where you're at with your relationship with alcohol right now? Sure. Absolutely. Uh, I love the, um, I love the, 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 the glass of wine, the bottle of wine. Um, you know, do, do I go overboard at times? Sometimes sure. Yeah. But, um, you know, I, I go through these stints where I will stop drinking for a month or two just to help my body. Um, yeah. You know, alcohol for me is part of, literally part of my job of entertaining. Um, yeah, for sure. If I, and, and I, you know, I've been through enough, Gina, where I knew if I had a problem or I had an issue with it. And by the way, my wife would zip me right into place <laughs> if she thought yes. I had a problem with it. But um, I, I know when to stop, I know what my limits are. And I know that uh, I don't have a problem because I know that I can stop for three or four months and really get my body back into shape and, and, and it does not bother me. So I'm very, very comfortable in where I am. And, you know, Hey, listen, I'm not going to tell you, I don't get, you know, get a little bit over intoxicated every once in a while. So everybody does at certain right. spots, but I, I don't, um, I, that is not a common, common um, theme for me, which I'm very That's proud awesome. of. That's mm -hmm. awesome. Now you, uh, you alluded to this and I want to get to this, um, not being inducted into the hockey hall of fame. When you look at the numbers, I mean, you're top 50 in, in goals, top 50 in points all time. Uh, most of the guys ahead of you are either still active or they're already in the Hockey Hall of Fame. Just to put it in perspective, and I think this was a really good perspective point that just happened about a month ago. Austin Matthews hits uh, 500 career points, does it in 445 games. There's only four guys in NHL history, U.S.-born guys, who did it faster than Austin Matthews. Faster than Austin Matthews. And we're all talking about Austin Matthews. He's, he's down the path of a hall of fame career. It was Craig Janney, Kevin Stevens, and number one on the list fastest to 500 points for us born player is Jeremy Roenick. I didn't know does, that. Does it? Yeah. Does, does it hurt you that sometimes that people forget what you accomplished in your career well, because you i mean the start of your career was spectacular the stuff that you did yeah you won a silver medal at the olympic games you went to nagano yeah. you played at nagano as well you were at two world junior championships where you the numbers you put up for team usa stood for a quarter of a century yeah, before right. jordan schrader finally came and and knocked that's off right. those numbers i mean the stats the numbers that the things that you got a silver at the canada cup you won world championship like i don't know I don't yeah. know, Jr. Yeah, it's um. So again, this is going to be a long answer, and I'm I apologize. But, no, that's um, okay, man. This is your platform. Um, um. So, does it bother me? Yes, it bothers me tremendously. Because and it bothers me watching some of these people that go in. Yeah. Before me, now, listen. I understand the whole process. Um, you have to have somebody on the on the count on the committee that, that you know that supports you or nominates yeah. you or it's a it's definitely it's definitely a, a, a relationship based pick. Um, I've come to find that out and at least realize that now. Um, so this is this is always my answer. I, and everybody says if you talk about the Hall of Fame, you're never going to get in. Well, I don't think I'm going to get in anyway, so I'll talk about it. Um, because I I'm don't know, Jared. Point. See, I'm I'm not comfortable with the fact that you're you're not going to get in. I think people well, need to. I forget. appreciate that. I appreciate I think that. People need to forget some things that happened. But I think that happens down the road because at sure. one point people are going to look at just the numbers and go, holy crap, why is this guy not in? So I didn't mean to interrupt you, sure. I just, you know. Well, there's a lot of guys. There's a lot, there are a lot of guys in the National Hockey League who've had some personal issues yeah. that they've had to overcome, whether they were personal issues or they were um, law, law abiding issues mm -hmm. um, that are still in it. So yeah. I think I think with me is I was such a polarizing figure. Um, I had no problem speaking my mind. I had no problem ruffling feathers. Mm -hmm. I had no, no problem calling out um, certain entities. Um, and I think I did, I think I did a lot for the national hockey league in terms of uh, exposure, both by the way, 
my, I played. And by the way, I interviewed, I think I gave yeah. me, I think I gave media um, a good story all the time. And I talked yeah. to them, whether I was mad or whether I was happy, whether I won or whether I lost, I was committed to the game. You know, my stats for the, as a U.S. player um, speak for themselves, yeah. I believe. So this is my, this is my answer to your whole thing. Um, am I disappointed? Extremely. Um, but I will have to say I'm more disappointed in the fact of what does the hall of fame stand for? What does it mean? And everybody tells me it's your, your effect on the game, what you've done for the game of hockey, your impact on the game of hockey. And I believe that I have done that, um, times 10, uh, both on and off the ice. Now, just because you're negative sometimes, um, and you're, the media creates or has created a Jeremy Roenick really that never really existed. Right. They call me, you know, egocentric and an asshole and, you know, all that stuff, but you can go yeah. around, you can, you can go around North America and you'll find hundreds of millions of people that have come into contact with me that will disagree with that just by the yeah. way that I treat them on a daily day basis. However, there have been some stumbles infinite. along the way though, right? JR. Sure. I mean, of you're course. You're the first guy to admit that. Of course. I, I mean, I've stuck my foot in my mouth. I've been an asshole. I've been controversial. I've said things that I would maybe want to take back, but yeah. that's life. I mean, everybody makes mistakes, but I mean, the mistakes that I, there, there are people that made bigger mistakes than I have that are in the hall of fame. Okay. So let's just leave it at that. For me, why isn't a guy like Alexander Mogilny in the hall of fame? You have a guy like Alexander Mogilny who. You want to talk about changing the the game? Yeah. Somebody who had an effect on the National Hockey League like nobody else has. If Alexander Mogilny doesn't affect out of Russia back in the late 80s and kind of change that mentality for Russian players to come play and open up the eyes of the Russian of course, Federation, yeah. there there would be no Russian players playing here if, the, if at that yeah. time, right? He he put his life on the line. He put his career on the line at home, put his family at home on the line. And he, he changed the, the course of the Russian uh, uh, NHL uh, relationship. Yeah. Not to mention he scored 485 goals. He yeah. played in a couple of Olympics. He won a Stanley cup, uh, a glorified career. You have a guy like Theo Fleury. Okay. Um, over, overcame one of the worst, um, sexual abuse um, situations to lift himself up to score over 450 goals. He won a wor he won world cups. He won Stanley cups. He won Olympic gold medals and he overcame the size that he was to, to have a career. He's not in. You have Curtis Joseph who for the longest time was the fourth most winning this goaltender in NHL history yeah. through the year, through the years of ties when there were ties in the game. Um, you just had Luongo and, and Theo Fleury have passed him because of that, the shootout uh, situation, more so Fleury. So I look at these guys and I'm like, I, I feel more bad for these guys. So what are, what are really the, yeah. the stipulations to get in? You just had two, two Swedes go in or three Swedes go in this past year. One of them, you can double his goals and they don't add up to the goals that I had. Yeah. So, so it, it comes down to this. It comes down to this. What I'm really disappointed in, why I'm not there, is because my dad will never get to see it happen. Because mm -hmm. my dad passed passed away in 2021, and I think he deserved that opportunity to see that. But what he get, what he gave up through his life, the the miles, just like every other father that has gotten their their kid to a, a, a professional level. But my dad actually gave up hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars in jobs just to make sure that I was in the right yeah. place to play hockey. He'll never get to see that happen. And that, yeah. that, I think that hurts me more than anything, but you know what, you know, my life, my life does not, is not going to be dependent on whether um, the hall of fame committee decides that I'm worthy enough to be on it. I feel good in my, in what I did for this game, whether it was controversial or not. And I'll be the first one to say, I've made many mistakes, but so has everybody else. And a lot of people, seem to get second chances here and there, but yeah. some people don't. Um, I appreciate your honesty because it's been a, it's been a hard journey with you. Um, I mean, you were always great to us in the media because you're always outspoken. 
And then sometimes, you know, cause you're a flamboyant guy, you're flamboyant, sure. your character. And sometimes it, I'm passionate. Uh, I'm yeah, passionate. You're, you're passionate about the stuff you do. And that's always been a real battle, but I, I guess I just kind of fall back on what you said. And like, if we're talking about if the hockey hall of fame becomes a behavior thing, then we'd have to open up the doors and do a lot of, you know, cleaning and checking. We'd have to do a lot no, of that. There's, there, there's no question about it, but yeah. listen, again, again, um, I'm in a good place in my life and I had a good great career. career and I did, I had a great career. And, um, you know, you look at back at some of the things that I did, you look at my stats and my stats speak for themselves. Yes. I had a really tough go from 2004 to 2007. I mean, yeah. I still was, I was still flying high with the flyers. Uh, the coyotes I had great seasons with the coyotes. I mean, yeah. obviously Chicago speaks for themselves. I think, um, I think the riff that I that I created with uh, Bill Wirtz is one thing that I would oh, what I would take back in a New York second or in a Chicago mm-hmm. second. Um, I learned really really early that uh, the owners are the owners for a reason, and you don't disrespect the owners no matter who you are, and yeah. uh, understand understand the process. But that's growing, right? I mean, I was 26 yeah. years old at the time, and 26 year olds make mistakes, which you know I did. Your body took a lot of beating during your career uh you mentioned the concussions um you you had uh, i mean from a television standpoint two of the nastiest looking injuries i've ever seen in your broken mm-hmm. jaws taking yep. that slap shot in the face from boris mirnov and 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 then shattering your jaw and like was it 30 plus places there, there like places yeah 1998 mm-hmm. and and that game yeah. against you know between the where you had dallas what, do you mind taking us back through through those yeah, two incidents, because I've heard you talk about your, your broken jaws. And I, when I think back about the reason I bring it up is because you like, it wasn't, it was bad enough that it was broken jaws, but they were head injuries, yeah, which then bad. went on to affect you with traumatic brain injuries at those points. Yeah, very much so. And that's a whole new, a whole different topic in itself, but I'll take you back to 90 and 98 or 99. It was towards the end of the season and, and Dallas was in Phoenix and um, Mike Madano and I, although very good friends, he was my utter foe because he was, he was the guy that I always, <laughs> I always aligned myself saying, okay, Mike Madonna was always the, noted as the best U S guy of our yeah. generation, which I still believe he's the best U S player ever, ever played Mike Madano. Yeah. I think Austin Matthews is going to join him at that Patrick Kane. But at the time, I always, I always leveled myself or rated myself by how I played against Mike Madano. Yeah. So um, he's coming. And there was a healthy that. animosity there too, because he was from. Very. It was the yeah. the east eastern U.S. Detroit. against the central. Yep. <laughs> Very much so. But even even growing up as kids, going to the U.S. camps, you know who was the better player? Was it Madano? Was it Ronick? You know, Madano yeah. got drafted number one overall. I got drafted eighth overall, same year, yeah. and there was always that. So he he was my he was my stepping stone. He was my block. Yeah. So every time You're I played against him, yes, and. So I wanted the best of them. I mean, and unfortunately, I, you know, Mike took the worst of, of a lot of things that happened between us because I was a physical player. He wasn't. Yeah. And he was coming he, in this specific instance. He was coming around the net. He passed it in front, looked for looked at his pass, and I kind of knocked him out behind the net, took him out of the game. Yeah. The next night, the next night we go into Dallas. So it's a back to back game. Now there's yeah. only two game, two games left in the season. And in the paper the next day in Dallas, it's like payback is a B I blank, yeah. blank, blank. And you know, I knew it was coming. I knew I was yeah. going to get it just so happens. I didn't think it was going to come as early as it did. So I'm flying around the net. Craig Ludwig slashes my, my finger breaks my thumb in two places. And then Hatcher a split second later comes jumps with a flying elbow. And my, sh- my jaw just burst, burst into, into pieces. And I remember standing at the bench, pulling, you know, literally pulling my teeth out of my, almost out of my mouth. If, if it wasn't connected with skin, I'd literally be able to pull my jaw wow. out. And I remember the lady in the front row kind of passed out, looking at all the blood <laughs> flying out. And, and I remember it was a five on three because Lugwood and, and, um, and Hatcher got penalties. And the, the trainer says, okay, we got to get out of here. We got to go get that thing, you know, looked at and x-rayed. And I said, I said, um, it's broken. Don't, don't worry about that. We have five on three. I said, I, I am going to go out and I'm going to play this five on three. I don't care what happens to my jaw because I want to score a goal so bad. Oh, man. 
So I want to score a goal so bad, Gene. I'm going to tell you what was going through my mind. And you know, at the time, my mentality and the way I was at the time, I wanted to score a goal on that five on three so bad and leave for the leave the ice for the hospital with my two middle fingers in the air to everybody as yep. they were cheering cheering my injury. So I played the five on three. Unfortunately, I didn't score, but I went and got it uh, went and got it fixed uh, back in Phoenix. I, I went home spitting blood in a cup i couldn't eat anything couldn't drink anything i'm spitting blood playing cards on the plane with the jaw smashed all over the place and i remember getting it fixed and 16 days later was game seven against uh st st louis and i put this big mask on and went and went out and played because i wanted to win and it didn't matter if my jaw got broken again the jaw will heal um i could still play the game that that win was more important than my jaw and you know th but those are some of the things that how many people would do i mean i did it because yeah. i wanted to win i wanted it for my city i wanted it for my teammates and um you know the boris moranoff one was just a slap shot i was in the wrong place at the wrong time it hit me dead square in the mouth and um was one of the most gruesome things i'll, I'll ever forget and that was a major concussion that um that uh that that happened and i had another one in the playoffs against tampa that same year that um, you know that summer was a tough one but injuries yeah. have, are part of the game but i've had a lot of them i, I certainly have a lot of them but I, I feel pretty good right now i'm taking good care of myself i'm so glad you're you're feeling okay after all that because that was that was i mean for viewers if, you, if you're okay with gruesome and you know fair warning google yeah. Jeremy Roanick broken jaw and it's some of the worst nastiest videos I've ever seen. We're in conversation yeah, no. with USA Hockey Hall of Famer, top fifty scorer in NHL history, Jeremy Roanick. This is the Seven Eleven Overtime Podcast. I'm your host, Gino Renna. You talked about coming back after those broken jaws. Um, <clears throat> now, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it was only about a month and a half later after the Miranov slap shot that broke your jaw that you became a part of Toronto Maple Leaf folklore history. Yeah. Do you want to share that with your yeah. audience? Cause it's better coming from you than coming yeah. from me. <laughs> um, well, I, I played, uh, I'm, I'm going to tell Which you was what, amazing so, that you came back at all. Well, the doctors told me eight weeks after yeah. I got my jaw wired, they said eight weeks, then you can play again. And I remember on the eighth, the, the day of the eighth week, we had the last game of the season. And I think that game of the season determined our our seeding in the yeah, playoffs. Who you were going to face and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. So I said, I'm playing this game. I mean, it is eight, it is week A to the date, eight yeah. to the date. And I remember going to the rink with my jaw wired shut, and I went into the training room and I said, take these things off, take them <laughs> off, because I'm expecting to play because I've been skating but not physical activity. People the have to remember said, you're not eating normally now either because your jaw's no. been wired shut for eight weeks. Eight weeks, correct. <laughs> So I said, take them off. I'm playing tonight. So, like, whoa, 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 JR, you can't do that. No, you can't do that. Come, we'll take them out off at the office tomorrow properly and all that stuff. I said, F that. I called down to to uh, to the train to the equipment trainer, and get your I pliers. Said, get your get your wire cutters and pliers. And they brought them in. And I literally looked in the mirror. And I clipped one, clipped the other, and pulled the wire out. And the doctors went, No, oh, stop. So they said, stop. They said, okay, we'll pull them out. So they pulled them out in the locker room. I ended up playing that game. We ended up winning. And I had a pretty good game. I had one assist, I think. But uh, we got the spot. And in the second round, which we, the, the, the the game you're referring to, obviously Philadelphia, Toronto, it's a great rivalry. And Toronto is one of my favorite places to play in, all, in my whole career. Playing in the old Maple Leaf Gardens was great. Playing in the Air, Air Canada Center was uh, unbelievable, what it was at the time. And uh, overtime, uh, game six, I'd already scored, the, I think, the first goal of the game. And now yep. overtime, uh, I think it was um, Leachy or Sundin turns the puck over inside their our blue line and a two-on-one. I throw one over Eddie Bell for shoulder, my ex, my, one of my greatest friends and ex-teammates, yep. to, to, to win, um, the, win the series. Uh, that was the last time Toronto Maple Leafs had actually won a series. It was in 2004. Um, yeah. at that shot, that shot. But I remember Sammy Kapanen got hit so hard, you know, that the Do you whole remember who place, hit him? Yeah, it was, it, it was uh, Darcy Tucker. Darcy and Tucker, Darcy, yeah. Darcy took took me out, the, the you know, the game before. But yeah. Darcy hit him so hard, 
And Sammy Kapanen, who's 5'7", five, 5'8", five, he had the wherewithal, which, by the way, nobody in the National Hockey League would do today. No. Would get He got up, and he had duck legs, and he's trying to get to the, to the bench. Keith Primo kind of hook sticks him to the bench, and I jump out. The place is still rocking and ro- rolling, and I bury that one top shelf on Eddie, and all of a sudden the place goes dead silent. Yeah. dead silent and and it was like it was 45 seconds later after the hit yeah. it was that tight yeah it was that tight yeah. and i rem- there's a picture of me celebrating with marcus ragnarsson coming to, to, to grab me i'm in the air celebrating and in the background all the fans you see people going like this with their yeah. hands over their head people with their head down <laughs> and there's one guy that's back there that's in the middle of giving me the finger he's like He's literally getting ready to flick me the finger. Yeah. And I thought that was just like a perfect kind of scenario of how that whole, whole game. But yeah, I, I when and the I Leafs Toronto, have never won a playoff series since that night, since this, they have the JR jinx right now, <laughs> they have the JR jinx. And every time I go to Toronto and, and you know how great Toronto fans are and yeah. how respectful they are, they say, JR, we hate you. And love you all at the same time. I get the same response every time I go and we have great conversations. And it is the number one talking point when I go into Toronto. It is amazing. It's amazing. Uh, and you're right. You, you, you're you a polarizing figure. You always have been in your entire career. And uh, I'll, I'll be honest with you. I, I did not expect our conversation to to go the way it did with, with such openness mm-hmm. about uh, your daughter's struggles. And we're so thankful that she's doing well and, and your, your comments about your own struggles. And I'm so, so happy for you that you're doing so much better. Um, it's something I, and you mentioned the fans and I, and I will say this, there was probably nobody. Well, I shouldn't say that. Uh, you're no, you amongst the it. best. You're amongst the best guys mm-hmm. in the NHL when it comes to relationship with fans. Yes. Uh, you've never said no to an interview because you want the fans to be able to hear you. There's the, the stuff that went back and forth with yourself and Petra, which was, I mean, do, right. do you yeah. want to share that story about that? Cause that is an yeah, epic story. Well, I think everybody should look back to the 1996 playoffs and watch Sandus Ozelinch trip me on an all out breakaway. I mean, it is the, it is by far the worst non call in <laughs> playoff history, not to get a, a penalty shot in overtime when Chicago is battling Colorado. And I had just absolutely burned Patrick Waugh in the game before in a breakaway, just, you did. I mean, he, he didn't even get close. Yeah. So I complained like crazy after the game, because we ended up losing in overtime and Patrick heard me complaining and said he wouldn't have, he would have saved it anyway. And I come back and say, well, where was he in game three? You know, I put his jock in the rafters and so yeah. on and so <laughs> forth. Then he comes back with the, I have two Stanley cup ring blocking my ear and just the whole back and forth with two very passionate, two very egocentric, but competitive people. It, um, and, and we laugh about it. And when we talk about it, we laughed about it because he's a wonderful man. Yeah. And I, I'm, I, I'm happy to call him my friend, but we, we had that competitive juices against each other. That was, was epic. And that's what I loved about the game. I, I loved every aspect of it. So that was fun. But, and I, I you know, I will say in terms of fans, you see kids throwing pucks to the fans these days and all that stuff and, and helping. Back in 1998, when I came to the Chicago Blackhawks, you didn't see any player throwing pucks over the glass. And I would stay yeah. after, and I would throw pucks to the kids and make sure that uh, that they had a they had an experience that they knew that I appreciated them being there because I think um, it's it's very important to let people know, acknowledge the fact that you appreciate that. I've never never said no to an autograph on the street in an airport uh, coming out of or in a building. Um, it's, it's very, very important, and it still is to me today, and um, I'll never get sick of it. Share the root of where that all began, your experience as a young boy yeah. and your, yeah, your first meeting with Gordie Howe. I was seven years old living in Hartford, and Gordie Howe was playing for the Whalers with Mark and Marty. Um, he was playing with his two sons. And I played in this little arena in West Hartford where the, where the Hartford Whalers practiced, and I finished my game and we all went in the locker room and the Hartford Whalers were coming out for pregame skates. So we took our stuff off, our skates off. We went back to the ice and we're all hanging over the glass, just in awe watching the Hartford Whalers shoot the puck and how well they skated. And, you know, it's like one of these, every time somebody goes by, your head is moving. Yeah. And, and I watched the player go by and all of a sudden this, a bunch of snow gets dumped on my head. 
and I and I look and it's Gordy Howe. He dumped a whole bunch of snow on my head and he skated around and he came by again and I'm wiping the snow off my head. I'm looking at him, he winks at me. And it was so cool because, you know, there was 25, 30 kids that were next to me on the glass, you know, that was looking at the same thing. But Gordy Howe didn't dump snow on their head. He dumped it on mm -hmm. mine. So for me, for a young kid, it was like, we just had a moment. Gordy Howe singled me out and acknowledged my existence. It was really cool. It was a one-on-one, -on -one, even though it was nothing for him. He was, he was just having fun. He didn't. He didn't have to go out of his way out of his way to think about doing something. It was just what he did. But it made an impression on me. I told my parents. I told my friends at school. I told my teachers. You know, I'm t I'm 53 years old. I'm telling you the story right now. And I realized as I was growing older and still remembering that situation, it it meant nothing for Gordy, but it meant a a, a lifetime story for me. And I knew that if I got to that same situation, that I could create a story, I can create a memory, I can create something that's, that is going to last somebody for a long time with just a second of my time. And I tried to make sure I did, did that every single time I was on the ice, whether it was reaching through the glass, through the camera hole where the camera guy takes pictures and grabbing popcorn out of a kid's bag when he's not looking during commercial and eat it. And he's looking at me like, what just happened? <laughs> Taking a hat off a kid's head, put it on my helmet, just having fun with people and acknowledging their, that they came to watch us, me, play. And um, it, it's, I have people now at 53 come up and tell me stories. So it, it, it comes, nice. comes back, it comes back, you know, in spades, because I still get the stories now at 53, and it really brings a lot of joy to my heart. Amazing, JR. Uh, so much of this conversation didn't go anywhere near where I thought it would, but I think it's so much more pertinent because it's stuff that's come from your heart we're wrapping up i want to give you an opportunity to come full circle um to your discussion about your openness about mental health yeah stage is yours if there's something you want to say to the fans if there's something you want to say to people a comment about uh, about yep. mental health it's up to you buddy you get the last word so for me um life is not an easy thing it's it's never a flat road uh, you're gonna you're gonna go through um, peaks and you're gonna go through valleys. You're gonna have friends and you're gonna lose friends. And it's impossible to have a a life where you're not gonna be sad at point. Sometimes depressed at sometimes challenged at sometimes. But the one thing I think that I've learned and I've learned through the experiences with my daughter and other friends is that uh, number one, you have to acknowledge that there's a problem, not hide from it not um, not try to uh, get through it just by yourself in private. Um, make sure you talk to somebody about it. Um, it's it, it, it's not it's not a bad thing if you if you're feeling um, disoriented, it's not a bad thing if you have a substance problem. everybody falls into something. Everybody has problems in their lives. Um, it's what you do with that problem and the help that you get. That's the most important thing. And nobody, this is the biggest thing. Nobody is ever going to look at you and say something bad because you reach out for help. Mm -hmm. They're going to admire it. And, and the, the people in your life that are important to you are going to try to help. Um, you're never going to get um, ridiculed for, for accepting that you have a problem and trying to get better. You'll find every single person will come to your aid that loves you. And it's that it's that that's going to make you heal. Um, it's not embarrassing. Never be embarrassed with having issues, problems, um, mental illness or addictions, because there's always someone that wants to help you. JR, thank you. Thank You're you welcome. for your openness, your honesty, uh, your willingness to, to put it out there. I, I, I hope that people will really take to heart what you've had to say because it's been you've had some unbelievable highs and you've had some very very difficult times as well mm -hmm. and you're starting to come out on the other side of it which is fantastic thank you jr that's great thanks gino it's always great being with you buddy miss you a lot a top 50 score all-time list in the nhl usa hockey hall of famer and one of only four U.S. born players to score 500 in NHL history. Jeremy Roenick telling his story. 
The Overtime Podcast is proudly presented by 7-Eleven. Before leaving the rink, order your favorite Slurpee, fresh 100% premium Arabica coffee, hot from the oven pizza and wings, pint of ice cream, or even a carton of milk, eggs, and a loaf of bread from the 7Now app. And Team 7-Eleven will have your order ready for pickup 24-7. Hey, if you missed any parts of the show, don't worry. Visit our website at OvertimePodcast.ca where you can both listen and subscribe to future shows. 7-Eleven's Overtime Podcast can be found on the iHeartRadio app, Spotify, iTunes Podcasts, or any of your favorite podcast platforms. Until next week, I'm Gino Reddit saying so long, hockey fans, and thanks for joining us on the 7-Eleven Overtime Podcast. 